Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. We're going to talk about uh, atomic force microscopy and what's called nanometrology. So uh, thank you for coming. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Good afternoon. And uh, thank you for, for having me on your show. And I'll be delighted to come and share you some uh, some of my world with your audience this afternoon. So, yes, thank you for having me. Yeah, I love to see pictures of, um, you know, like electron microscope pictures of like a fly's eye and things like that. They're amazing. So it's really cool that you turn to this spectroscopy. Tell me about your work. What What are you focused on in your research? So I'm a trained as a physicist, uh, designing those interesting type of microscope, which I'll explain to you what they are in a second. And uh, But the core of our work at the moment is to, to try to find out how we can try to diagnose connective t- tissue disorders. So that's disease of the skin, all the way to maybe some cancer as well, using this type of microscopy that enable us not just to see the tissue at a very small scale, but also to feel it. So to feel it with almost with a sense of touch. And that is very, very important because when you reach a certain size or certain dimension, when you look at protein, protein structure, well, you don't really see them really anymore. You can't use your eyes to see them. You just mentioned about electron microscopy, which is about where we, which is a technique where we can see the smaller subject. But if you want to go smaller than a, I guess, a few tens of nanometer, you have to go with atomic force microscopy. Atomic force microscopy is a technique that uh, for some of your listeners who may have used uh, vinyl recorders and they use a stylus, they place a stylus on top of the vinyl disc and the, and when the vinyl disc is spinning, the stylus go up and down playing the notes. That's exactly what we do. So we use a very, very tiny stylus that come into contact with the structure that you're trying to image and that stylus go up and down and using a sophisticated laser system we we look at the motion of the stylus up and down and then with a computer we can recreate three dimensional images that created uh, the deflection of a cantilever in the first place and yeah what happens the um, electrostatic repulsion will push the stylus up and down and that's how you can tell what the surface features look like so so that's a super question. So extrastic repulsion, we often work with van der Waals forces, which are tiny, tiny force of interaction between our stylus and the, the sample itself. But uh, if I tell you that everything that we know in currently in our living world uh, is covered with a tiny, tiny layer of water. So in fact, our stylus has got a tiny droplet, a tiny layer of water, probably one or two atom, a two molecule uh, fixed, right? And so our sample, so in fact, you've got two water layers 
on top of each other and simply we are sliding on the very, very fine water uh, layers that sit on the sample and our stylus. So yes, yeah, so we're able to try to measure so what we call the topography. So people may have seen the Alps, may have seen big mountain, and can see all these big ridges. Well, this is exactly what we see at a very, very small scale. So we look prodding the surface of our sample uh, with our stylus uh, and rebuilding that three-dimensional images that tell us how the sample feels like. Since the feature size is so small, mm-hmm. how do you line up the tip? How do you orient it? I mean, because I would think you'd, you'd have to orient it and... I mean, do you use like electron microscopy to localize an area to raster over and then you get in there? Like, how do you do this? No, we just simply use high resolution optical microscopy and the tip itself is the shot. The tip is to be considered like a tiny needle. The end of the needle is about 20 nanometer in diameter. It's absolutely tiny. And we simply place that tiny needle on the surface of the sample and we just simply gently press it until we define a certain what we call contact force and that contact force needs to be uh, applied very carefully because for example if we're imaging live cells we don't want to be going through the cell wall so we're monitoring that force all the time so the contact force that we want monitoring is extremely important and once we've applied that contact force we can keep the force constant so regardless of deflection up and down on the sample uh, we still can produce an image but again if the tip is 20 nanometers yep I mean, how far do you raster over something? So the tip is 20 nanometer, but the tip is shaped as a pyramid. So the, the top of the pyramid is 20 nanometer. The bottom of the pyramid is mounted on a long beam, which is about 200 micron long and uh, about 40 micron in, uh, in width. So this is something with, uh, if you've got very good eyes, you can, you can see them with your eyes. We often use small microscope. And that tip is simply mounted inside the AFM that, that has itself its own optics. So we've got a video feed of our probe or the cantilever on our video feed. And we can, we can raster scan that probe now of a region. So a smallest region, we can just do, let's say, 500 by 500 nanometer scan, or we can do very large scans, sometime reaching in the region of 100 by 100 micron scan. We cannot go really above 100 by 100 micron scan. So that is one, upon one millimeter. I just wonder because the tip is so small and mm-hmm. so many orders of magnitude smaller than, you know, the surface of whatever it is you're looking at. How do you even get it in the right neighborhood? Like what's the limit of uh, high-end optical microscopy and how, you know, can it get you on the putting green, like golf, how close yes, can it Yes, it you? can. But uh, very often, very often what, what we do in the film is that we take a lot of images and uh, so finding exactly the features that you want, what well, is all matters about the sample preparation and in fact of replicating the same different area over different samples and I'm not going to call it by luck, but uh, through repetition, you end up obtaining images of features that you want to. But that's that if you want to a feature. But for example, in my lab, we're looking at uh, images of skin. So we're looking at the difference between what we call the papillary dermis and the reticular dermis, so two different layers of skin. And I want to see simply how that skin is different as a function of age, as with aging. So because we want to try, try to do an audit of the skin, we're not looking particularly for a feature. So we imaging random sites and try to understand what happened at this random site and then try to take all that data, all these images to try to understand what's happened or for, the, for another patient or for a group of patients, for example. So sometimes you're targeting features, sometimes you're not targeting features. So what kinds of uh, interesting things have you seen in some of your spectroscopy in terms of skin or other living systems? Yeah, so I guess one of the... Um, when I was a young researcher, one of the first things I was being asked to do as a, as a postdoc was to image something that most listeners will know, which is collagen. And collagen is the most abundant protein inside the human body. And uh, I was being asked by my prof at the time to try to image the molecules, the collagen molecule. That collagen molecule is a triple helix. So most people will know the double helix of DNA. Well, collagen is a triple helix and it's about 300 nanometers long. So that's 0.3 millimeter, no, 0.3 micron, sorry. So 300 nanometer long and 1.5 nanometer wide. So it's a, it's a, sometimes I describe it like a long vermicelli um, and try to resolve this. And what's the beauty of AFM is that I was one of the first, if not the first, to ever image that uh, that molecule, so that long strand. 
but we also managed to resolve the triple helix. That means that we could see the bumps at the surface of the molecule that were matching what was the surgical values for the triple helix. So since then, we've, we've done a lot of works and uh, the bread and butter that we tend to do in my, in my lab is really to look at collagen structure. So it's a beautiful banding piracy along the collagen fibril, 67 nanometers, looking at that from so collagen from patient, but also from, I was fortunate to, to work on collagen from parchment, some old books, and even look, so looking at the structure of that collagen, which is exactly the same in written parchment as what you can find inside a patient. So really looking at that conservation. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. We've looked at a numbers of bacteria species, fuel cells, fibroblasts. So we've really looked at a wide variety of biological entities. So looking from scaffold, tissue, collagen, cells. So there's really no limits. And maybe if I, if I can come back to your general opening statement, why, why is this different from electron microscopy? Well, the beauty of this technique is that you can really look at the sample in its native environment. So cells, we don't need to fix them. Tissue, we don't need to fix them. We can carry on measuring them while they're being hydrated or simulated uh, living environment. So that's the key difference from electron microscopy type of imaging with AFM. So what interesting features of collagen have you seen? The interesting features of collagen that, that we've been looking at has been really to try to focus on... Uh, so collagen's got a banding parity. So collagen is long febrile, long, almost like long spaghetti. But if we start to look at high resolution, we can see there is a banding parity on the febrile itself. So it's an annular parity that go along the long axis of the febrile. And this is something that we've, we've seen over and over and over. So what we started to do in my group is to look at how this parity change as a function of disease, how it is there to try to mitigate damage on the collagen fibril as we go as uh, different different disease uh, progress um, and also how and we started also now to be interested to see how cell can harness uh, the presence of this banding perosity to try to move that's something that we're also interested to look at what do you, what do you mean i don't understand what you said harness what the fact that there is a banding perosity on the surface of the fibril so the cells now always tells us the collagen and we've got some ideas behind the fact that the cells can use those collagen fibril as ladder to be moving up and down inside the matrix. What, what do you mean? So the inside a cell, the collagen is no, used so, as so, a system or between no, no, cells? No, no. So, okay, I'll try to, to make this a little bit clearer. So inside the extra matrix, we've got collagen fibril with banding parasites. They form most of your matrix inside your skin, inside your bone. So in fact, what we're starting to understand is how, for example, if you take fibroblast uh, from your extracellular matrix, how they can use the fact that there is a banding parasite on the fibril to try to, to move along the fibril and especially in relation to cancer. So how when the collagen become very fibrotic, when we've got a very beautiful banding velocity, how the fibroblasts move along those very fibrotic fibrils. So the fibroblasts, what, they're, they're finding spots it's, on the collagen and yeah, anchoring they're using and... them as a rail track. It's literally a rail track system. Does that make it easier to understand? Yeah, but the fibroblasts don't start out on the rail track system. They're floating around, right? And then Cor- they come to an area, but they latch on and they start to ride these fibrils from there correct. or what? Yes, the correct. That, is, that is correct. Yes. So well, why do they do that? And what, what happens once they attach onto a fibril? What do they, do they look for damage or what, what happens? No, what they do is they try to, they move along the fibril as a fibril becomes super fibrotic and try to, so this is a pattern of front invasion in terms of cancer biology and how they try to, to migrate to other sites by 
simply latching on the collagen fibril and moving along the fibrils. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yes. Why would a fibroblast latch on to a particular bit of collagen and where is it well, going? The so role of the collagen inside the body is to provide a matrix, to provide a template for cells to be able to to survive. So, in fact, the cells are not, strictly uh, speaking, free-floating with, within the environment. They are always attached to focal adhesion point to different points in the matrix. So the cells are not just a balloon free-floating. They are attached to the matrix. So, in a, so which, which cells? You mean the fibroblast or the yes. collagen itself? F- fibroblast. Oh, I thought fibroblasts can migrate through many parts of the body to where there's damage and they, uh, they form, uh, you know, fibrotic tissue there. Co- that is correct, but they have to be attached to something. They cannot just be free floating. So in cancer, what we, so maybe I reframe this a little bit with cancer. So, um, so what are we interested to, to look into, into cancer, uh, and especially all cancers? So all cancer, type of cancers are diagnosed very, very late. So, Meaning that the chance of survival from, from patient is, uh, is usually very low. So what it's trying to do here is to try to, to try to develop a new system to look at early cancer progression by focusing not on the change of, from dysplasia to precancerous lesion, but to look at change in the matrix in, at early cancer stage. So normally histology just look, as I said, at um, a change in cell behavior, cell crowding, cell shape. What we're trying to do, and that's what has been the histology for well over 100 years. What we're trying to do now in our, in our group is to try to, well, let's, let's look at the histology on one side because there are some very, very clever people to do that. And let's try to focus our attention into the matrix. So we know that for certain type of cancer, for example, in, in, in breast cancer, there is a huge change in term of collagen production and there is also change in collagen stiffness, so mechanical properties. So we're trying to see whether we can find the similar phenotypic markers inside created inside a matrix surrounding early cancer lesion. So now we're looking at a change in morphology of the fibril to see whether it's become more fibrotic. In this case, it'll be much more straight a fibril and whether the mechanical properties of the fibril is increased also, suggesting that now we've got a pro-fibrotic environment that would lead towards bigger an increase in terms of pattern invasion for the cancer to develop. Well, how, how does fibrosis happen? How does it look normally compared to cancer? What causes uh, fibrosis to happen? And, you know, is the structure different in cancer versus healthy cells? So fibrosis is a dysregulation of uh, the fibroblast activity. And um, so it leads into the production of, of the overexpression of uh, an enzyme that's create, that's called a LOX. And LOX, so lysyl exidase mediated enzyme, will crosslink collagen and make it more stiffer. So the more crosslinks, for me, the analogy I tend to use very often for those who don't know about fibrosis, is like uh, dipping your, your collagen inside some super glue and it becomes extremely stiff. The problem with that type of crosslinks, that type of um, stiffening of collagen is that it, it is pretty much irreversible. So structurally, the collagen become very strong, but so strong that now the body is unable to turn it over. So that's why we talk about fibrotic capsule around certain tumors, because effectively it, it acts as a, as a membrane that now um, the normal uh, matrix turnover mechanism inside the body is not able to, um, to break it down. So what does that re- mean? Is there a cycling of collagen and fibrosis in various tissues or so no so once you get a a structure does it stay forever or what happens yes so in fact the problem exactly of um of fibrosis is a lack of cycling of collagen so normally we've got our bodies a turnover in our body so we've got an injury we've got new collagen being produced or when we grow when we the skeleton grow we've got new collagen production uh inside our bone but in case of fibrosis so In case of fibrosis, this doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen because effectively the mechanism which should break down the collagen as part of the turnover is unable to break down the fibrotic collagen because it's over cross-linked. Yeah, what if someone gets a cut on their skin? Okay. I mean, have you looked at that? And, and, you know, does that look at all the same as uh, cancer and a tumor? Or does that look different as well? So mechanically, they would be fairly similar. 
and in fact the scarring uh, the scarring on on the skin is um, can lead to fibrosis as well and the same that uh, the sort of fibrosis that we expect around the tumor so interestingly enough, the, the meshwork, so when we look at the meshwork of the tissue around the scarring, it tends to be fairly well aligned to promote the closure of the, of the wound itself. Whereas, so the, the collagen fibrils tend to have a, a given orientation uh, in relation to the open scar. Um, whereas in terms of what we've seen anyway at our scale, in, in case around the um, tumor tissue, strangely enough, the collagen become a little bit more disorganized. So that means that the fibril are not following a particular direction. So it's a much more curly rather than straight that we can see around, uh, around the scar and the skin. And the reason for that is because when the collagen fibril become overly crosslinked by those locks, so they stand, they tend to have a much more inherent stress and strain inside the fibril, meaning that they tend to recoil on themselves. So is that as if they were so tight on the inside that they lose the, the, the strong alignment of one versus the others that we tend to call them registration when the fibril are all lined up in a single direction. But when they over cross-link, over, yeah, over fibrotic, they tend to curl up on themselves. So we can see structural differences there between between the two different types of fibrosis. So they curl back on themselves, they're yeah. not structured properly. So what happens when you have different uh, fibrils that are in the same neighborhood? Do they cross-link with each other and make like a tangled mess? Like, so, what does it look like in the final product? Yeah, no, no. Again, a, a scar that heals. Again, it is a very, very good question. So if I take, for example, the example of skin, a normal healthy skin will have a big collagen sheet so all the collagen fibril inside that collagen sheet inside your skin all follow the same direction. They all will be like those spaghettis pre before they're being cooked, all very well lined up. Um, upon fibrosis, what we tend to see is that now all this collagen fibril curl on themselves. So yes, it become a tangled mess. Um, now all the collagen fibril are not there to try to behave accordingly to one another and they start to be behaving independently. So in fact, they're losing. So we're losing, if you want, the collective behavior of the fibril and they become each a single entity, but a single entity that is very, very stiff. So there's no preferential orientation. There's a loss of function of the tissue uh, that is related all the way down to the ways that the fibril look like and the fact that it become all curly on themselves. So what can be done about this? If you understand the structure of uh, you know, a fibrotic capsule that forms around a tumor, yep. then what? what? What is the disassembly mechanism or the remodeling mechanism that, that organisms undergo, you know, that takes the collagen, breaks it down, turns it into some kind of mobile form and then reforms yep. it somewhere else? The so basic principle for uh, for collagen breakdown inside the body is, is related to metaproteinases that come and simply cleave cleave the triple helix that forms the collagen fibril. So collagen fibril is form of thousands of triple helix of collagen that staggered together in very well defined manner, and then they're being crosslinked. We just discussed. And then you've got the zanzite that come and latch on on the triple helix and cleave it at specific sites. And eventually, this, this, the cleave molecule and then cleave fibril start to disassemble completely and then being, being reused. Now, in a case of fibrosis, we can't, so also the, the enzyme, the enzyme will try to come and break down the collagen. What we, what we tend to notice is that the enzyme are not able to break down completely the collagen. So the, what we've noticed, for example, in our lab is that the, that burning pulsy, like I was talking earlier on, at the surface of the fibril tend to, tend to disappear, but yet the fibril still remains. So in fact, those, Metaproteinases have nibbled at the surface of the fibril, but have been unable to break down the core of the fibril. Why? Because those crosslinks, those locks crosslink inside the fibril themselves act, act simply as a scaffold and hold very tightly the fragment of molecule um, that have been cleaved. So that's, so that's why. So what does he mean? What does he mean? What can we do about it? Well, 
finding cure for fibrosis is an ongoing work. Trying to reverse a point of fibrosis, it's an ongoing work, mostly due to, mostly at the fibroblast level. So how we can prevent fibroblasts for turning pro-fibrotic, that's the work of some, some very great research group. Once a matrix, once a collagen matrix has become fibrotic, there's actually very little that has been done or has been done at the moment to try to reverse the property of collagen. It's incredibly difficult to do so because we can't break those crosslinks. But what we can do, what we can do nonetheless, is try to observe when the property of the collagen is changing to try to tell us, hang on here, the matrix is changing, something is going wrong, even so we, we may not be able to detect that the fibroblasts are, are pro-fibrotic. So we can look at the cues on the matrix to tell us we're moving towards a disease state here. So what do you think is going to be possible in the next few years with your research? What do you think you'll be able to uncover? So what I think we're going to be able to do is to provide, to provide a much finer approach to early detection of cancer or connective tissue disorders by looking at the matrix, by focusing on the end product, because here we're talking about the end product. All the change in matrix is a result of change in cell behavior. So to do normal histology, we need to have a certain number of cells to be able to see to see cell crowding and so on and so on to be able to make the diagnostic. Here we're looking at if we have a few cells, what's happening at the matrix? And all the work relies on being able to find with a tiny probe those critical area. So that's why we're trying to work with uh, some different marker, fluorescence marker, for example, to try to identify region of interest before we put, we zoom in completely with our tiny probe and understand the matrix at the very small scale. So where we're going to be in a few years, in a few years, I do hope that we're going to be able to, to use that atomic force microscopy approach inside histopathology lab, that we're going to be able to use computer-assisted imaging and artificial intelligence to understand those images and be able to tell the, not just the patient, but also the clinician and the surgeon whether the area is of concern and how we can monitor that area by focusing not just on the cell, which we know how to do, but also look at the matrix because the endpoint is a matrix. Well, very good. Thank you for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.